Welcome back to our lecture on the checklist from Mastering Trial Advocacy. We're about halfway through the checklist on cross-examination. We're now going to get right down and focus on those individual pieces of the fundamentals of cross-examination. The first thing that I want you to remember is it's not an invasion. You know, to paraphrase uh, the great uh, Irving Younger, one of the best CLE teachers uh, that's ever been, uh, it's a surgical strike. It's not the invasion of Europe. So pick your targets carefully and make certain that as you pick them, they make sense in the overall goals of your case, as we've previously discussed. One of the things that we've talked about is having a topical cross-examination. And the topical cross-examination is advantageous because the witness can't predict where you're going. But the way that you make it even better is to use primacy and recency to your advantage. Yes, we're talking about it again. We want to make sure that the thing that we start the cross with is a bang and the thing that we end the cross with is a bang so that those moments of power, those things that are going to stick out the most to the members of the jury, we take the most advantage of in cross. Now one of the things that's out there that's said all the time on cross-examination is that you avoid the ultimate question. And you avoid the ultimate question because the witness will lie to you. I think that that's not bad advice, but it actually ignores the reality of the situation, which is that when redirect occurs, the first thing that's going to happen is the ultimate question is going to be asked by opposing counsel. And the witness is going to be given the ability to explain. So when we think about the ultimate question, we teach new lawyers, don't ask it, leave it alone, because you're never going to get the answer that you want. But every single one of us who's been in the courtroom for a while knows that sometimes you have to break the rules. And one of the rules in this outline, in this checklist, that I think in the right set of circumstances you can break is asking the ultimate question with the following caveat. You only ask it when everyone in the courtroom knows what the answer is. And if the witness doesn't agree, they're all going to decide they're a liar. That's when you ask the ultimate question. Otherwise, you leave it alone. On cross-examination, we're sticking to one fact per question. What do I mean by that? I'm not going to ask the witness, after you left the bar, you went outside, you saw the blue car going down the street. Instead, I'm going to break that up. Closing time came out. Last call. You got your last drink. You went outside. You saw the moon, the stars. You looked at the street. You saw the car. It was blue. By building that pattern, right? By doing one fact per question, I remove the witness's ability to go, well, you know, actually, and actually have to make them focus in on what I'm talking about. By approaching things with a one fact angle, we are removing the witness's ability to argue with us about nitpicky stuff, and we're also removing the jury's tendency to see us as lawyers who are arguing about semantics rather than the facts. If you use the one fact question example just discussed, you don't have to worry about needing to vary your questioning techniques. What do I mean? Uh, one, um, one thing that's routinely taught in some areas of the country is to put a tagline on the end of every cross-examination question so that everyone knows that it's a question. You got your last drink. Isn't that true? You drank it. Isn't that true? You then went outside. Isn't that true? Isn't it true that that's awful irritating after a short period of time? Varying your questioning techniques, using one fact per question, allows you to have flow. It also means that sometimes I can be humorous, sometimes I can be matter of fact, sometimes I can be compassionate, but still ask the question that needs to be asked. Imagine uh, the snitch in a jail who's testified against your client. And Mr. Witness, you want to get out of prison, don't you? You have a family, a wife, three children, her pictures on the wall in your cell. You keep the pictures of your kids in your Bible, don't you? You look at them every night. You tell them good night. Sometimes you kiss them. You'd love to hold your children in your arms again, wouldn't you, sir? Wouldn't it be nice to take them to the park, to be free, to see them grow. We can understand why you might feel the need to testify against my client. I want to talk with you now 
about the sweet deal that you've cut with the prosecutor. All of that is destructive in the extreme to the credibility of the witness. None of it is mean or rude. It's compassion because sometimes kindness kills. We don't want to play with fire on cross-examination. What do we mean by that? We mean we don't ask questions that we don't already know the answer to, and we avoid open-ended questions for at least the first three to five years of practice. The reason for that is you want to keep that control. And again, that analogy of the cat and the door being open. Until you know that you can slam that door shut fast enough for the cat not to get out, it's not worth trying to go down there with a witness. But if you know that witness doesn't have a good answer to the question, and you know everybody in the courtroom knows that no answer is going to be good for it, it can be worth it, but there is the risk of getting burned. So as you're starting your skills as an advocate, don't go there. Use the facts. Ground yourself in your case analysis and make sure that you are going the appropriate distance with how far you push a witness. As you grow over time as an advocate, you'll develop a kind of a sixth sense about how far you can push something and when you can cross those lines. But until then, stay inside the lines when you color, you'll be happy for it. We've all had the experience of dealing with a witness who just won't play fair. They want to fight, they want to argue, uh, they want to be non-responsive, they want to ramble on. I'd like to give you a couple of ideas of how to control the uncontrollable witness. And the first one is this. Just hold your hand up. Wait for them to stop. Once they stop, restate your question exactly as you said it before. And drop your hand. If they're non-responsive again, hand goes right back up. Wait till they stop. Don't talk over them. Sir, did you hear my question? Did you understand the words that I was saying? Are you capable of answering the question? And then if I'm really feeling it, I might say, would you like for me to rephrase it to make it easier for you? That's a control technique. I'm pointing out that they're being rude and unreasonable. I'm not losing my cool. I'm not getting upset, but I'm demanding attention. Now, sometimes that won't work. It's not enough. They're just going to talk anyway. What can you do? Stop looking at the witness. Look at the jury. Shrug your shoulders. Shake your head. You let the witness ramble. When they finish, you turn back and you go, are you done? Let me rephrase this question. And then you go to the smallest question you can possibly answer on a fact that you know they have to answer appropriately or are you going to impeach them with a document? Because where does the witness always run? Where do you always have trouble with control? When they know that you don't have something that will give you control. If the witness is really difficult, the next thing that you can do when they start talking is just turn around, look at the papers on your desk, sort them. Eventually they'll shut up because you're not paying attention to them. And then you read the room and you decide, can I be snarky here? Has the witness given me permission to be uh, confrontational or do I still need to be polite? And that's going to come off on the demeanor of the witness and the goals of the cross-examination. And then you just come right back in. You come right back in. What do I not do when I'm trying to control a witness? I don't ask the judge for help. I don't need help from the judge. If I've reached the point where I need help from the judge, It'll be because the judge volunteers it because the witness is being completely unreasonable. Because I want the judge, sua sponte from the bench, to say, Counsel, this witness is being unreasonable. Mr. Witness, answer the lawyer's question. Sometimes what I can do when they don't answer is, Excuse me. You just testified on direct examination, right? You know that uh, that's your lawyer. I'm the lawyer for my client. Lawyers ask questions. Witnesses give answers. Why don't we try that now? My question to you was, and then I restate the question. When we talk about cross-examination, we want to move into talking about sequencing. And we want to talk about the key importance of avoiding a chronological cross-examination. 
when we're dealing with a witness that's confrontational the way that Dean Rose was describing. Whether that's the criminal defendant in a criminal trial, or a cop who knows that you're going to be able to go after them based on their record in a criminal trial, or maybe just a particularly obnoxious plaintiff or defendant in a civil case. If we know that there's going to be reasons for them to fight us tooth and nail on the simplest of things, doing a chronological cross-examination where we go through the events as they know how they happened does us no benefit. It does absolutely no favors. Instead, what we want to do is we want to engage in the game of chess. And we want to say, here's how we're going to bounce back and forth with this, and here's how we're going to deal with it. Let me identify my topics and move through them accordingly so that I don't have to get to the point where I say, that was not my question. My question to you was. By keeping them off of their game, by making them have to make those mental leaps to try and predict where you're going next, you're going to be able to get a better answer out of them. And you also want to unfold the idea of, let me start with some things that make me seem friendly to you. I'm being compassionate, I'm being kind, I'm following McCarthy's rule of not being cross on cross. And then if you, Mr. Witness, start to get unreasonable with me, I can turn to the members of the jury and go, I, I'm just asking a question and I'm not getting an answer. But that only works if you don't follow what was written in their deposition, for example. We don't want to keep them on the same track that they just went through in direct. We want to selectively pick out those facts that best support our theme and theory, which we've identified through proper case analysis, and use them to make the points that we need, not the points they want. You know, building off of that, the only time that we really cross-examine a witness with the idea of embarrassing them or frustrating them is when everyone else in the courtroom wishes that you'd do it just to shut them up. And that's reading the room. That's knowing how far you can go and when you can go. Just like on oppositional cross-examination or confrontational cross, we don't want to use the chronology. We don't want to do it in an informational cross-examination either. Sometimes I'm just picking out facts that support my theme and theory of the case. Chronologically addressing those gives the witness an opportunity to argue. Sequencing those facts in the order that I'm going to use to argue them in closing argument makes them seem more credible and then makes the closing argument seem more credible. Members of the jury, just as witness X told you on cross-examination, A is true, B is true, C is true, D is true. We're only here to talk about E. And witness didn't even know anything about E, but my witness did. Remember when we blah, 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 blah. Sequencing based upon the argument that I want to make and not the chronology of the information can really make that piece of cross much more palatable for everyone. Speaking of your case analysis, recall back to our conversation and opening about themes. The perfect theme is one that is present not just as a fun tagline in an opening or a closing, but it's something that you can weave into every set of questioning that you do. And so in cross-examination, you want to get it out there early and you want to get it out there often. Officer Robinson, I want to talk with you about what you don't know about this case. For a theme that you don't know what you don't know. You make sure you incorporate it back in, you tie it in, you use it as a subject header, you ask a whole line of questioning about it. You do it because that's the way you make the theme be the earworm that the members of the jury are repeating when they go back to that deliberation room. If you can't find a way to ask a question based upon your theme for your direct and your cross, for your cross in particular, you haven't found your theme yet and you need to go back and rework. Work. The power of a theme cross-examination is so great that we recommend that you consider closing out your cross with the theme using the concepts of, again, primacy and recency so that it's the last thing the jury hears. Uh, you can even bookend it so it's the first thing the jury hears and the last thing the jury hears. So, for example, if the overarching theme of, of my theory of the case for this witness is they're so biased and prejudiced that you can't rely on anything you say, they say. I'm going to begin the cross with bias and prejudice, and I'm going to end the cross with bias and prejudice, because that's where I'm going to make my money. If credibility with a witness is an issue, because bias and credibility are always relevant and never collateral, I'm going to start my first vignette of cross with a credibility run. And the reason that I want to do that is because I want the jury to then doubt everything the witness says after that point. Now, there may be a time when it's appropriate to save that for an end. If you have a really sympathetic witness, that even though they've got this massive credibility issue, 
say that it's, oh, a sweet little old lady from down the street. It may not look great to call her a liar, liar, pants on fire right away. And so instead to gently move towards that. That's one of those bending those rules that can happen once you've got the experience. But for starting off, if I've got a credibility issue, if I've got a 609 issue I can use, if there's something that I can say that's a, hey, we've got some reason to doubt what you're saying here today. We want to frame the entire cross-examination from that starting point so that afterwards, the jury only cares what comes out of your mouth, not what comes out of the witness's mouth. This is not. One of the beauties of impeachment as a subset of cross-examination is that it gives you the power of the law to get into certain issues and to offer extrinsic evidence if the witness does not agree with you. And that's why, quite often, bias, prejudice, motive to lie, personal interest of the witness is a great way to start the cross because if they don't agree with you, you're going to be able to bring in the evidence to show that not only did they have the bias, prejudice, and motive to lie, but they lied about having the bias, prejudice, and motive to lie. And when that happens, you know, to quote my grandmother, their butterball timer has popped out and it's time to take them out of the oven. When we think about ending a cross-examination, we don't want things to drift off into the sunset. And we don't want to ask an objectionable question for the last thing that we do. What we instead want to do is end on a vignette that's powerful. You want to find your mic drop moment. And that mic drop moment should be something that you know is grounded in the facts, that you know is grounded in your case analysis, and that you don't care what the witness has to say when they answer it. Simply, you're going to stand there, ask the question, and depending on how much of a jerk the witness has been the entire time, you may even turn your back and start to walk back to counsel table before they even open their mouth and let the judge know. No further questions, Your Honor. Some areas of cross-examination are going to be risky and some of them are going to be safe. Um, don't start with an issue or a vignette that you know the witness is going to fight you on because you've not yet established who's in control and who's in charge. Get them on the yes train or the no train, depending on which train you're driving with that particular witness, and you get them agreeing, agreeing, and agreeing with you, and then you get into the area that is um, more problematic. Because if you do it properly, the yes train will carry over and you can even get a yes answer uh, to something that they desperately want to say no. And once it's out of their mouth, it's in the jury's head. Just like we talked about not playing with fire, you don't want to lead or end with a risky vignette. You want those power moments. How you take off and how you land makes a difference in the whole flight. Think about it for a moment and compare it to the last time you were able to take a, an airline cross country. The thing we all remember is, how was the takeoff? How was the landing? There's a little bit of turbulence in the air, that's fine. But those moments when I'm leaving the ground and when I'm coming back down to it, that's the thing that stick with me. And so I want to make sure that those are clean, those are on point, and I don't have any problems with them. If I've got multiple modalities of impeachment, for heaven's sake, start with the one that's strongest. Begin well to end well. Assert control. I like to think of it this way. If I'm in a fight with someone, if I hit you in the mouth hard the first time, the fight may be over with. Uh, and that's a great place to be on cross-examination. When we have multiple impeachment vignettes, don't follow them up one right after another, after another, after another. It starts to lose its efficacy at that point. Instead, hit them with a 609. Go down a couple of rabbit holes, go down some other trails and lines of cross-examination, then hit them with a 613. Go down some other rabbit holes, then end with the bias of the fact that they've been best friends with the defendant that they're testifying for for the past 30 years. By dispersing them out, what you're doing is continually reminding the jury at appropriate times this person is not to be trusted. Now, if you expect a no answer, get them on the yes train first. We've talked about that. The other thing I want to mention, though, is that sometimes I put these one fact questions, these vignettes together, to paint a cohesive picture that leads to the argument that I want to make to the jury, the goal question of the cross-examination. Don't forget, uh, in your desire to control the witness and to put certain facts first uh, to get the witness on the yes train, don't forget to paint the story that you want to paint with this witness. It may not be chronological, but it needs to be logical.
Those vignettes need to paint a coherent picture for the members of the jury. It needs to be clear and understandable what your goal is. If they're wondering what you're doing, you're not accomplishing the goals of cross-examination. Instead, all you're doing is muddling, muddying the waters and making them wonder why you are wasting their time, something you never want a jury thinking while you're on cross. Finally, if I've got a portion of the cross-examination that I know is gonna be problematic, that cuts into the power of my oppose, opponent's case, I'm gonna bury it in the middle so that if I lose that fight or if it doesn't come through clearly, I can recover and reestablish the important points for my case. Uh, juries have an attention span like everyone else, just like you do, just like I do. Uh, and I think at least for this topic, our attention span has ended. Uh, we'll see you in the next presentation.